So my name is uh, Dr. Wahome Karanja. I'm a consultant, ear, nose and throat, head and neck surgeon. I'm working in Nairobi in the Prodigy ENT and Hearing Clinic located in KMA Centre in Upper Hill. Um, on behalf of the Kenya Pediatric Association and the Fi Pfizer um, Educational Grant, I'm pleased um, to be able to offer this online CME um, on common problems, different views, the pediatrician and the ENT approach. So in terms of um, ground rules, um, ENTs uh, and take two, two stands. One is that we are minimalist and two, we really appreciate the teamwork approach with our fellow colleagues, the pediatricians. So I'll begin with the nose. And uh, in front of you, you can see a picture of a child who is having nose bleeding or epistaxis. Now, epistaxis is a common occurrence in children, uh, regardless of the age group, uh, maybe unilateral or bilateral, and, and therefore history is important. In majority of this age group, we are dealing with an anterior um, bleed from the littles area, which is a convergence at the anterior nasal septum of the va generally valveless blood vessels. Um, if you have a unilateral and um, epistaxis, uh, you are likely to be dealing with a localized problem. And the commonest cause for epistaxis in children is actually uh, nose picking. Others include upper respiratory infections or inflammation, inflammations of whatever cause. And of course, there are more sinister um, causes, which include um, bleeding diathesis um, and problems with coagulation. A good history and physical examination is necessary because um, epistaxis can actually be fatal. And a good understanding of primary first aid in terms of uh, nose pinching and leaning back, maybe cold compresses with ice, is useful um, for the clinicians to be able to teach. And I think these are two areas that we generally agree on in terms of both ENT and pediatrics. So once you have uh, stemmed bleeding from first aid, then um, in terms of follow-up, what should you advise these children or their parents? One is to avoid blowing their nose and therefore you just wipe it gently because blowing the nose dislodges clots and therefore causes worse bleeding. And avoid hot drinks because of vasodilation that can lead to further bleeding. Um, antibiotic creams can be applied in the area of epistaxis for about a week. And when you have severe um, epistaxis, then that may be a reason to um, admit and therefore um, carry out um, certain um, tests and also, of course, maybe some invasive um, maneuvers to be able to stem the bleeding. Of course, a full blood count um, would be warranted in uh, excessive bleeding and we can be able to do um, silver nitrate uh, cautery uh, even in an outpatient setup and you can be able to pack or use electrocautery. If it is very severe coming from the um, SPA, then uh, ligation may be done or embolization of the external carotid artery intraoperatively. What do you need for cautery? And this is something that is uh, good and important for all of us to have. You need a good light source, preferably one that is on the headlight, which allows you to have a two-handed approach. Um, you need a nasal speculum or a l large um, aural speculum. A lignocaine spray or, or xylocaine spray is good, especially with adrenaline that can help to both vasoconstrict and cause um, anesthesia. Uh, cotton wool and cautery sticks or electrocautery and liquid paraffin which helps to moisturize the area. We want to speak a little bit about rhinosinusitis because this is definitely one of the most common problems that um, present children with. And uh, rhinosinusitis has uh, certain causes. One may be allergic, viral or infective which is bacterial, fungal and also autoimmune. In terms of definition, um, rhinosinusitis may be acute, which means symptoms persist less than 12 weeks or chronic uh, for more than uh, 12 weeks. Um, most studies show that 15% uh, of the population are affected by rhinosinusitis, and there's a lot of mil uh, working days lost per year in the UK and in the world at large um, from sinusitis. And generally, the symptoms are, you know what, my cold won't go away, and this is persistent persistent without improvement for more than 10 to 14 days, sometimes worsening after uh, five days. And we divide the symptoms into major and minor, major being uh, nasal congestion or obstruction, purulent nasal discharge, loss of smell, or facial pain, ear pain or fullness. 
And in terms of minor, you may have tenderness over the sinus area, fever, headache, halitosis, fatigue or lethargy, and postnasal drip. What you need to exclude on the physical examination from the history is a periorbital swelling or extraocular muscle dysfunction because this might uh, imply a complication, orbital complication of uh, sinusitis, which is more common in children. Um, you want to exclude foreign bodies, especially if you are talking about a unilateral nasal discharge, uh, concomitant otitis media, which is common in children with ear pain, uh, central nervous system complications like meningitis or abscesses, and of course polypoid changes or uh, deviated septum, which is a bit rare in children. And what you expect to see on examination is uh, swelling or erythema of the nasal mucosa, mucopurulent secretions, or tenderness over the sinuses. And you want to consider uh, emergency admission to hospital if the symptoms are accompanied by a systemic illness, a swelling or cellulitis on the face, signs of uh, central nervous system involvement, or orbital involvement. And of course, it is good to consider ENT referral if uh, you have persistent symptoms that are not um, are going away with treatment, especially those that might uh, suggest a cyanonasal tumor, for example, bleeding, an untender facial pain, facial swelling, and unilateral polyps. And of course, a routine referral if you have more than three to four episodes per year, lasting more than 10 days, no symptoms uh, between episodes. A CT scan necessary to make a diagnosis of rhinosinusitis? Um, considerably not. And the reason being, sinusitis is actually a clinical diagnosis based on um, symptoms and, um, and, 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 and physical findings. So if you have two or more major symptoms, or if you have uh, um, more than three minor with one major symptom, then you definitely have a diagnosis of sinusitis. Where do we um, require to have a CT scan in patients? Generally, as a rule, um, if you have persistent or chronic rhinosinusitis and you are considering um, surgical intervention, in this case you would consider having a CT scan because it would um, act as um, a guide um, to uh, very necessary structures, uh, and in this case the orbit or the brain uh, to, to be areas of avoidance when you're um, going in for endoscopic sinus surgery. Having said that, especially in this part of the world where we don't have a lot of cystic fibrosis uh, or ciliary uh, dysfunction and disorders, um, endoscopic sinus surgery in children is really um, not the norm and therefore um, as a rule I would, I would say you know what, uh, avoid um, asking for CT scans which would Otherwise, uh, just give um, undue um, irradiation to these children. How do you manage acute rhinosinusitis? Majority being viral, of course, symptomatic um, management is considerable. But if you have uh, bacterial, which usually has the most severe or prolonged symptoms, um, then you want to give a course of antibiotics. The commonest microorganisms, of course, tend to be strep pneumonia, H influenza, and Moraxella catarralis. And therefore, first line treatment would be amoxicillin and second line being uh, amoxicillin, clavulinic acid, or azithromycin for those who have penicillin allergies. Ideally, uh, what is most important in terms of treatment for sinusitis is you, we need to give treatment for an, a period not less than 10 days, preferably 14 days, to have um, effective and complete management. And nasal foreign bodies, these are commonest in the age group between one to four. And uh, one of the problems they, they, they present is a potential risk to the airway. And of course, you want to suspect this, especially if you have a unilateral symptom of blockage with a foul smelling discharge. Now, the rule is, unless it's simply too simple to get at, uh, or the child is very compliant, do not attempt to remove, unless, of course, you are able to restrain the child and you have the necessary um, instruments, which uh, could include hooks um, or crocodile forceps, within the office environment and of course adequate lighting to be able to remove them because the risk is pushing them further in or actually complicating through um, upper airway obstruction. Nasal fractures are rare but in the older age group especially because of sports more common in uh, boys and it's best to view from above and of course they would present with a history of um, trauma with uh, nasal bleeding and it is necessary to exclude a septal hematoma because that requires immediate drainage and if you do not drain then of course you have a risk for developing a septal abscess which will uh, um, break down um, the nasal septum and therefore cause a saddle uh, nasal deformity. As a rule we want um, the nasal 
uh, fractures to be dealt with at least within the first 14 days after the injury when the tissues are still malleable and of course when edema has reduced significantly. And majority of times we do this through a closed reduction intraoperatively. We want to talk a little bit about the adenoids, of course, which is um, the commonest problem that we deal with in children in terms of upper airway obstruction. And this is uh, basically part of the tissue which is uh, called the valdeas ring um, and adenoids specifically found in the postnasal space with a peak age of development and therefore symptoms between the age of four to five years. But of course, we see children with earlier symptoms of nasal obstruction presenting. What are the current indications? And we borrow from our setup from the American Academy, which says, you know what, if you have four or more episodes of recurrent purulent rhinorrhea in the prior 12 months in an infant, or if you have persisting symptoms of adenoiditis after two courses of antibiotic therapy, or you have sleep disturbance with nasal airway obstruction persisting at least three months. The other indications in, in, uh, include hyponasal or hypernasal speech, otitis media with effusion for more than three months, or a second set of um, grommet tubes, dental mal malocclusion or orofacial growth disturbance documented by an orthodontist, cardiopulmonary complications, and of course we should not wait for this, including co-pulmonale, pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular hypertrophy associated with upper airway obstruction, and otitis media with effusion um, in, the, in, in an age group above four. These are indications for adenoid surgery. Now, it is controversial um, whether to include um, adenoidectomy with um, myringotomy and grommet insertion at the same time, but by and large, as a rule, we would prefer to uh, get rid of the adenoids and allow um, uh, re-establishment of uh, proper flow through the eustachian tube. And in case of uh, persistence of otitis media, then we can consider myringotomy and grommets. So in terms of the throat, of course, sore throat, um, commonly would, would, ca would happen from a rhinovirus or viral infections. Of course, there is group A beta hemolytic strep uh, throat, which carries the risk of other uh, non suppurative complications, herpes simplex virus, and of course, Epstein Barr virus. The other non infectious causes of sore throat include physical irritation, hay fever, Steven Johnson syndrome, Kawasaki disease, or oral mucositis secondary to chemo or radiotherapy. In terms of complications of strep uh, pharyngitis, these are rare, and the superative ones include otitis media, acute sinusitis, peritonsular cellulitis, peritonsular abscess or quincy, pharyngeal abscess and retropharyngeal abscess, more common in children. And of course, um, in terms of treatment, um, bacterial tonsillitis is uh, something we all clinicians would be able to treat, but in terms of a peritonsular abscess, this requires a drainage, and in the case of a second episode of a peritonsillar abscess, you need to consider um, a tonsillectomy. The non superative complications we are all aware of include rheumatic fever or post-trep glomerulonephritis. When do we need to refer um, tonsillitis or sore throat? One is to be able to admit if you're dealing with strider or respiratory di uh, difficulty, especially if you're dealing with um, um, a complication like, um, <coughs> excuse me, if you're dealing with, uh, with, with the complications of trismus, drooling, or dysphagia. Again, if you are having dehydration, unable to take in fluids, um, this uh, requ requires, of course, fluid resuscitation. And if you're having severe superative complications, for example, abnormal swelling or suspected abscesses that require drainage. Um, again, if you're dealing uh, with a child who is systemically unwell and at risk of immunosuppression, suspected Kawasaki disease, or a profoundly unwell child uh, in an unknown case. What are the indications for tonsillectomy for acute, for recurrent acute sore throat? One, and, and, and this would require um, tonsillectomy by definition as something that is documented by a clinician to be fever um, and painful swallowing and temperatures probably above 38 degrees centigrade and uh, mucopyrulent discharge over the palatine tonsils. So again, as in, an indication, if you're having sore throats that are due to acute tonsillitis, Episodes of sore throat that are disabling and uh, preventing normal functioning, which would be seven or more well-documented, clinically significant, and adequately treated sore throats in the preceding year, or five or more such episodes in each of the preceding two years, or three or more such episodes in each of the preceding three years. Vertigo. 
Now, vertigo is not very common in children and many times um, would be as a result of a systemic disease. For example, if you have um, an upper respiratory infection with a viral um, uh, of viral origin. Vertigo generally is a symptom that refers to a perception of spinning or rotation of the person, their surroundings in the absence of physical movement. In terms of peripheral vertigo, which usually arises from uh, labyrinthine causes, you may be dealing with either benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, vestibular neuronitis, which is more common in children, or Meniere's disease. Central vertigos, which are usually of cerebellar, cerebellar origin, are commonly resulting as uh, resulting from migraine in young uh, adolescents or adults and uncommonly because of stroke or other symptoms which are more common in the elderly. Tinnitus is an unwanted perception of sound within the head in the absence of sound from the external environment. It can be described as a ringing, a hissing, buzzing, roaring or humming sound. And they may be subjective or objective. Commonly with children, they result from an abnormal um, uh, exposure to loud sounds, especially if it is unilateral, or as a result of um, medications that might be ototoxic. In terms of foreign bodies of the throat, um, you mainly get them in the areas of uh, narrowing, which would be the throat or the esophagus, and if you have complete dysphagia of acute onset, then there is a high chance of a foreign body obstruction. If you have a delayed onset of foreign body sensation after eating and mild symptoms, it could simply be an abrasion and the symptoms tend to go away in about 48 hours. And of course, you need to refer if this does not resolve. Um, there are uh, certain um, home remedies that have been prescribed, but these need to be done with care. For example, giving esophageal uh, food bolus like taking a banana, taking a Coke or pineapple juice and so on, that can be useful. Um, facial nerve or the seventh nerve palsy is a uh, lower motor, especially a uh, lower motor neuron uh, which involves the forehead is a rare occurrence and um, it can also affect taste to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Possible causes might be trauma where you have facial lacerations uh, or blunt trauma or uh, what can be found in newborn paralysis. It could be neoplastic which is rarer in children, infectious um, because uh, for example happy zoster or idiopathic in this case Bell's palsy. So we need to do a full head and neck examination when we have, uh, uh, when we are faced with a facial nerve palsy. And if it's Ramsey Hunt, we can give a cyclovir for a certain duration of time. Steroids are usually helpful. And of course, eye taping at night uh, with um, artificial tears are useful uh, to protect uh, and close the eye. And of course, we need to refer if there is a hearing loss and of course, if there are ophthalmic complications. Again, prognosis depends on cause, but by and large, um, they tend to recover well and fully with physiotherapy. Salivary gland problems are also uh, are things that we face um, uh, with uh, commonly sialolithiasis or inflammation or sialoadenitis. It may be acute, chronic or recurrent, and tumors are rare in the pediatric age group. In terms of inspection, we need to inspect the enlarged glands and all others. If it is tender, then we are more likely dealing with the sialolithiasis. If it's non-tender, possibly tumor. And when you have more than one gland affected, it may be autoimmune or viral. For example, in mums, which is the common cause of parotid, parotid enlargement in children. And of course, it's important to test the facial nerve. It's important to inspect the oral cav cavity, both manually and bimanually. And you might be able to uh, palpate a stone or express parts from a duct in case of infection. Um, in terms of the ear, um, of course, we know that the ear is divided into three parts, which is the outer um, ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear, with a separation of the round and oval window, and of course the tympanic membrane. What is most important is for us to be able to do a proper um, otologic examination, either with a video otoscope or a traditional otoscope that can be able to delineate um, the landmarks within the ears, which would be the handle of the malleus, um, the cone of light, and of course the pus tensor and the pus flaccida. Um, external otitis is an inflammatory disorder of the skin lining the external auditory canal. It may be acute, it may be chronic, and may be part of a generalized skin disorder. And commonly the pathogens are either bacterial 
or even fungal. But when you have a fungal otitis, you tend to have more intense itchiness and um, the treatment usually is a topical antibiotic or c um, steroid. Um, again, uh, otitis externa may extend to the pre or post auricular area, which would require um, uh, manipulation in terms of treatment and probably uh, systemic antibiotics. This would be worsened in somebody who is immunosuppressed, for example, diabetics or um, HIV infection. And of course, sometimes can be a pointer of uh, malignancy. Now, um, swimmers here is one of the most common um, uh, otitis externa uh, variants that we get and commonly you get a history of having traveled to the coast or having uh, uh, in, um, indulged in some form of swimming and you have intense itchiness, pain and irritation and probably um, oral fullness or blockage um, in a child many times unilaterally. So ideally with a good physical examination you can determine swelling of the external ear canal that would require may require treatment, may require um, oral weakening, and of course systemic analgesia or anti-inflammatories and topical um, antibiotics. Um, acute otitis media is common in children. In fact, it's probably the most common cause for uh, pediatric um, um, visits to an outpatient department where you present with otalgia and oral discharge. The child usually is unwell with pyrexia and very high um, temperatures. And on examination, you find a bulging, red, and very dimitous um, tympanic membrane. Commonly, these are caused by either streptococcus or hemophilus influenza, and treatment is usually amoxicillin or amoxicillin clavulinic acid for five to seven days. Unfortunately, um, in delayed treatment or no treatment at all, you may develop complications, with may, which may be mastoiditis, chronic otitis media, which uh, basically implies a perforation, or intracranial um, complications. Chronic suppurative otitis media um, is uh, something but that we certainly encounter frequently and uh, the usual history would be a presentation of recurrent ear discharge, hearing loss, perforation of the tympanic membrane which commonly is central and there may or may not be a presence of cholesteatoma of course which makes this a dangerous perforation. Marginal or attic perforations tend to be um, more dangerous, they may be related to cholesteatoma and they have little discharge which is offensive and you might be having bleeding or granulations that are associated. In terms of complications of chronic suppurative otitis media, you may have vestibular complications, you may have facial palsy or intracranial complications. How do you manage um, chronic otitis media? Again, um, this is where you probably need some level of lighting and um, aural weakening. The most important preamble to treatment of course is dry mopping with cotton wool and not your cotton bud. Um, suction clearance and therefore it helps to have suction. Thereafter uh, installation of eardrops and rarely do you require systemic antibiotics. Rarely do you need a surgical therapy in the immediate um, diagnost, uh, diagnostic period uh, except when you are considering meringoplasty or tympanoplasty. And of course you may require to have a mastoidectomy when you talk about mastoid involvement. Glue ear is common in children which um, many times might be uh, discovered either by a parent or a teacher and uh, in children who may be having recurrent ear infection. Sometimes you may have children presenting with unsteadiness or falling over and sometimes effusions persist for weeks after acute otitis media. But you know what? Fortunately 80% of otitis media with effusion tend to clear within eight weeks time and that's the reason why we are moving away from um, in instinctively um, uh, uh, recommending um, meringotomy and grommet uh, insertion as opposed to purely adenoidectomy in coexisting adenoid enlargement in these children. So in terms of signs of uh, otitis media with effusion, when you look through on uh, otoscopy, you'll find a dull or a retracted tympanic membrane. Uh, you might be fortunate to find an air fluid level and of course a conductive hearing loss. And, and, and this is where we insist that uh, uh, no ear examination is complete without a tuning fork examination that conducts both the Weber and the Rhinis test that um, proves evidence of a conductive hearing loss, especially in, in the um, children who are cooperative. And here I'll probably speak a little bit about uh, hearing testing in children. In Kenya, we do not give a routine hearing testing in children um, as one of the... Uh, following birth. But I think um, 
time has come to be able to institute such measures through autoacoustic emissioning. And because the earlier we are able to diagnose hearing loss, the easier and the earlier we can be able to treat these children and give them a semblance of a high quality of life. Having said that, um, hearing testing is divided into two, where you have objective hearing testing, which is your standard pure tone audiometry. And this is usually conducted in children above the age of five, in other words, who have been able to, who can be able to um, comply with instruction. Anyone below this developmental age of five uh, needs to be subjected to um, subjective hearing tests, which include bearer or autoacoustic emissions that can be able to uh, define the type and the level of hearing loss so that we can be able to institute um, treatments. And the treatments would in, uh, include anywhere from surgical treatment from um, hearing aid um, amplification or even cochlear implantation, which fortunately we are able to um, carry out today in our country. So if otitis uh, media is persistent for three months or more, then we would recommend uh, ENT referral and perhaps um, myringotomy with grommet tube insertion. In terms of treatment, uh, we want to treat otitis media with a fusion which has failed audiometry, in other words, confirmed um, conductive hearing loss flat or type B tympanograms, and a history of more than three episodes in the last six months or four in 12 months. And the treatment is usually grommet insertion and, um, and or also management of enlarged adenoids. Syringing. Now, this is one of those controversial um, subjects. When do we need to syringe or which ear needs syringing? Majority of times, fortunately, in children you have um, who, who develop wax impaction, the, the wax tends to be soft. So one of the things we want to do first is to soften that wax. And there are um, a lot of medications which are even over the counter that can be able to soften wax. Without those, in the absence of those medications, olive oil, which is your traditional um, medicinal um, um, product, can be instilled um, regularly and be able to soften wax that can be able to uh, be removed more easily. So one, you want to remove or syringe the ear which has an occ occlusive cerumen that is causing pain, causing hearing loss, or even causing tinnitus. Now avoid syringing in cerumen that is non-occlusive, which can be removed uh, through simple uh, methods like installation of wax softeners in an ear which has had pre previous surgery because then you can lead to complications in the only hearing ear because you can jeopardize uh, hearing in that ear, in a perforated tympanic membrane because then you're going to introduce infection, and of course in keratosis obturans. Rare in children, but this requires proper removal. And in the case of children, because of the pain thresholds, many times you want to clear this um, in an OR setting or under some form of sedation. So again, you have um, viral, uh, you, you have a common pathology which is viral uh, laryngitis. And this would suddenly be associated with aphonia, with a history of sore throat. And uh, you may, on examination, find that you have edema or erythema of both vocal cords. Treatment for viral laryngitis tends to be just voice rest, antibiotics, or pain relief medications. It can help, especially with um, eucalyptus uh, products. Hoarseness as a symptom um, may occur because of either a local or a systemic pathology, and is often seen uh, as an early symptom of a carcinoma, again, much rarer um, in this pediatric age group. Vocal cord nodules are not uh, very rare, and especially in a pediatric age group of between 5 and 15 years, especially in boys. And many times happens because of excessive of voice overuse, and treatment tends to be voice rest, a lot of um, rehydration with, um, with, uh, with the medications, and of course, speech therapy. Rarely will you require to have microlaryngeal excision. Laryngitis resulting from uh, gastroesophageal reflux is a new entity that is being increasingly recognized in children, which, um, in, in, in which case, especially in those who are communicating, tend to complain about a foreign body sensation, uh, globus or, or, or globus pharyngeus, a hawking or uh, constant throat clearing, and occasionally a nocturnal cough. And treatment tends to be, you know what, give anti-reflux medications and raise the end of the cot or the bed. Squamous papillomas have also been found, and especially respiratory uh, papillomas. And fortunately, the treatment for this is complete excision. Laser treatment less to be, uh, tends to be less de destructive, but they require treatment um, from time to time. Functional aphonia is also um, 
a condition that we find more in the female age group, in the pre-adolescent or adolescent age group, where you have um, uh, somebody forcing a whisper, you may have a normal cough or some level of what is called spastic dysphonia. Um, and many times the treatment for this tends to be speech therapy. So with that, I hope um, we've been able to cover um, lots of um, the areas that we find ourselves um, um, coexisting in terms of management of both pediatric ENT and pediatric um, medical conditions. Thank you. <music>